All right, so we started in on chapter one last week. We got all the way to verse 26. So we'll get back there, but I just want to kind of linger at the beginning of the chapter again, something we didn't get an opportunity to discuss. So we, if you have kind of heard poetically the start of Genesis 1, probably the words that come to mind are, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But in recent translations, so the New Revised Standard Version updated edition, as well as some other recent translations have started to use when God began to create the heavens and the earth. What difference do you see there? Exactly. Yeah. This version implies that perhaps God existed before the time of creation. And so creation is not the first moment of the universe, but something that God does at some point in some sort of divine history. So that's just an interesting cosmological difference um, that is nothing that we can settle in discussion or debate or scientific analysis, but suggesting that perhaps there was time of God's existence before the moment of creation, and then God enters into this act of creation. And I think that this version of the translation brings even more poetic beauty to what we said is happening here, that when we remember that this is the Hebrew people in conjunction with all of the other ancient Near Eastern cultures, taking bits and pieces of each other's mythologies and coming up with their own stories to try to explain what happened, how the universe came into being. We have this moment where God enters into creation or authors creation. So just as people are telling stories, in Genesis chapters 1 through 11, God, God's self is an author or a storyteller, and God's story is creation itself. Okay, so we got through the first six days of creation last week, and we paused to note that consistently the repetition that the days are good. God takes pleasure in this creation. And the last piece that we read was God telling creation to be fruitful and multiply. Verse 28 here. Uh, but in before that, God gives, let's see, ah, the same edict in verse 22. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. So creation is good enough that God wants it to propagate. There is the initial act of creation, but creation itself is invited into the act of creation as well, that we are many creators with the divine image of the creator in us. We continue to create. Now, surely you, after class last week, said, let's pause next week and very astutely talk about the ways in which this verse itself has been used um, to, in manipulative ways. The idea of be fruitful and multiply as if um, thinking of things said by modern day politicians that propagation of the species is necessary in order to be, um, to have human worth, to have value that one has to be engaged in being fruitful and multiply. So how has this been used against the LGBTQ community or has this been used against people who don't choose to participate in this edict of be fruitful and multiply? Any thoughts or reactions to that conversation? Yeah, Wendy? Is the original text of that word yeah, great question. So if you ever want to do just like really simple word study, um, you can go to a website called Bible Hub and you can bring up the Hebrew and the English at the same time. And you can look at other times that word is used to kind of get some context. So if you're watching online, let's share that screen instead. Okay. Do, do, do. Yeah, it's a great question. 
Okay, so it's the only time that verb is used in that form, meaning that part of speech. So that tells us nothing. Okay. So here's that verb in another form. Um, yeah, it just seems like a mathematical numerical term to increase. Yeah. Any other comments or reactions? In what you were just talking, you, you, you said it in a way that I could see it as participating in creation, which could mean supporting in any way. Ooh, um, I like that. Others and um, sorry, that sounds not specifically having your own child. So that kind of seems. I really like that, Shirley. And that's kind of part of the pro-life discussion where folks who are politically pro-life really don't do a lot to sustain or promote life or the multiplication of life. When we think about issues like how do you feed people, make sure that they have the food that they need? How do you make sure that they have the health care that they need? How do you make sure that they have the daycare that they need? How do you make sure that there's not a death penalty putting people to death? Um, so that's a great point that the, the creative acts that we're all capable of are not just procreative sexual acts. Um, it goes much beyond that. It doesn't bother me at all about the multiplied but in those times it wasn't even an issue on earth, I don't think. As in land use I think there was plenty of land to be allowed with people. Okay, yeah, just saying not a risk of overpopulation. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, we don't have any policies on how many kids. Yeah, yeah. And, and when we think about what might be at stake sociologically for being fruitful and multiply, when you are a very small people group and the Hebrews, in comparison to their other ancient Near Eastern neighbors, are smaller. And so, if you're going to be able to withstand encroachment by neighboring communities, you need to be able to be fruitful and multiply. So to put those words in the mouth of God has sociological implications. We need to increase our society as much as possible for our own protection. So it's already based on antagonism and hostility. <laughs> yeah, that's a hypothesis. So we're just thinking about things that they could be thinking about, well, but, but absolutely. I guess the argument that Musk or other people in advance are making right now is we need to multiply in order to have strength. And back then, yeah, your tribe, well, yeah. I mean, they're talking about having dominion over, over, over animals. animals. Over animals it's too. all about domination. <laughs> All right, good transition to where we said we would pick up today as well. Uh, what is this comment about dominion? So God says, let us make humans in our image. We've got a lot to kind of pause on. So before we get to dominion, let's just talk about our image. Um, so what is your initial reactions to hearing that? Let us make humans in our image. Well, a couple of weeks ago, the uh, Palestinian Christian uh, spoke at the Presbyterian. Oh, good. Church, so glad you got there. And he had a great line about ever since the beginning, mankind's been returning the favor. Oh, so creating God in its image. Oh, wow. That's powerful. So, for those online, comment in the room. Um, the uh, Palestinian Christian. Preacher who was at Good Shepherd Lutheran a couple of weeks ago said, since this line has been written, humankind has been returning the favor. God says, let us make humans in our image and humankind has been making God in its image. Oof, that's powerful. David? Sherry? Can you be referring to the Trinity? Can you be referring to the Trinity? Yeah, so that is a common statement about what this verse is. Um, and certainly looking back from our vantage point theologically we can read the trinity into this that perhaps god was referring to the multiple forms of god's self now the idea of the trinity doesn't develop for many centuries so the original authors of this text they themselves would not have a concept of the trinity that god exists in three persons as father son and holy spirit 
So um, if, if we're thinking that God is controlling the hand of the person writing this, then we could make that argument. Um, but if we're thinking in the mind of the person, human writing it, putting the story together, they wouldn't have had that idea in mind quite yet. So in more modern English, the word will be right there at that point. Is, 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 is there a parallel to that in English? Um, so that's a, a great question. So the royal we, um, when you're speaking in the first person, but use we. So there are some examples of that. Um, so that could potentially be what's happening here. Yeah. Elohim, or plural, isn't it? Elohim itself can be in plural or singular form. Um, and so that's another name for God used in Genesis. And that im ending is a plural ending. So it can function in both singular and plural ways. Yeah. Those well, are I mean, great I thoughts. I would go with the idea that this is a, a memory of a time when the Hebrews had a pantheon of mm -hmm. them, like other religions. And that part of the story of the Old Testament is arriving at <clears throat> one God, but that maybe it wasn't always that way, and that that memory is reflected in this text. Yeah, is that a? It is. is yeah, that, is, you all you all are biblical scholars. You have each <laughs> hit on exactly all the theories here of what's going on. So there is such beauty to think of at this time. Um, the idea of the eternal Christ, you know, being present in this time of creation. Um, and then there's lexical reasons for what could be going on here. And then another reason is exactly what David is hinting at as well. So um, the book of Job, um, which just in terms of the content of it, has some of the earliest Hebrew language used in that text. And if you're familiar with the story, Hasatan or the accuser is walking around the heavens along with the rest of the divine council. And so it's very much a pantheon type understanding where there are other gods sitting with the supreme or chief god. So yes, that is another idea here that this is a reference to the divine council. And as we go through the text, it is the story of the Hebrew people learning that Yahweh is the God and the only God, but yet they are surrounded by cultures that practice a, a pantheistic faith or polytheistic faith. So this would be, yeah, perhaps the divine council. So you've, you've hit on all the, the theories here. Any other comments or questions there? Well, yeah, Shirley. I guess we got to talk about what does it mean to be created in God's image. Mm. And um, I'm not sure, obviously, what it could. It can mean a lot of things, but I think we mean free will, um, some kind of higher thinking, and maybe the right knowledge, sort of an understanding of right and wrong ethics or something. Okay. Seem to be the things that are different than uh, we than the rest of creation, perhaps. Um, but I think it's just ironic that it says that. I mean, it's the first thing in the Bible, and then people have henceforth gone forward and decided some humans are less than others. Mm, 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 mm. Shirley says, we should pause and say, what does it mean that we are made in God's image? And you had a really great list. So you said kind of our, our rationality, our ability to decipher between right and wrong. What else did you say? Um, Free will, um, yeah, the ability to make choices and to be creative, to be creative in the same way God is creative as uh, being made in God's image here in the act of creation. Um, yeah, that's a really great list. And Shirley also said it as this is one of the first images we get in scripture. And so to imagine humanity treating any human as less than after it says humanity is created in the image of God seems preposterous. Other reactions to this, oh, God being made in God's image, what does that mean to you? What could it have meant to our early authors? Yeah, Donna? I think a lot of people back then maybe were a little more rustic in many ways. And I think a lot of the writing was a gathering of oral language, which became writing. 
the kind of corralling people into believing that this is a healthier way to live mm -hmm. than what most other people, families would probably be and people believe. I really think it's a way of, I don't mean corralling them so I can't have their own thoughts, but making them think that there is order really in this chaos. Oh, is interesting. a way to get people to gather together. Yeah. Um, so Donna's saying kind of the sharing of these stories in the old tradition is a way to convince people that there is order to the chaos. There's a better way of life within community, within a relationship with God. That's very astute. Yeah. Yeah, Ben? I think that uh, humanity is so diverse that we have so many different colors and shapes and ways of being uh, that that image cannot be unitary. And to say that mm. humans are made in the image of God, it means that God is not just able-bodied, you know, if you want to think about it that way, but God is disabled, God is clear and trans, God is all of the different colors, different shape sizes, mental abilities, everything. Yeah, beautiful. So a, a theological observation there, the diversity of humanity suggests the diversity of God, that humanity made in God's image means that that for someone who is disabled to understand God as disabled or queer or trans. Yeah, beautiful. Chris? Yeah, it's letting us know, and we'll get into this, um, that the word is Adam. So that's how we get the name Adam. And the word Adam comes from the Hebrew Adama, meaning round. And so when Adam is created from the Adama, that's how we're getting that word. This, this will take us slightly back, but maybe forward to. So I was a little bit stuck. We were talking about multiply. And we started to say, oh, so there are people who will be relatively larger throughout the world. But there's, there's no other people, right? This is this the stories are the creation of humankind, not the, not the Hebrew people. Right. So, the, so maybe potentially in the future, we know the Tower of Babel will happen along with that in the book of the Greeks. But it seems it seems like a stretch to say the group will multiply. It's like so you can squander them. Well, there's nobody else but who you squander them. Yes, yes. So that makes sense. Um, if this is being written at a time in which yeah. we're at the beginning yeah. of humanity. So, the, of course, the folklore is that Moses is writing it, which would have been much later in time. He's the one writing it down. We know it's probably multiple authors. And so stories are being swapped when there is a larger community than just the first humanity. But I think that's a really great observation to say, what are they thinking in terms of the importance of the growth of humanity at, at this time in which the story is taking place? It wouldn't be for growing so you're bigger than local populations. What else could it be for? Well, it could be for the sheer fact that humanity is good in the eyes of God or creation is good in the eyes of God. So that's a really good point that when it's being shared as an oral tradition, there's a bigger community, but they are speaking of a time where they believe there is, or it's the community story of an origin and so there's other reasons for propagating at that point. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Uh, make a uh, made in God's image. We're also going to get the story in Genesis 2 where God breathes into Adam. So we are made in the image of God, and we also have the breath of God or the life of God, the ruach, that's just a Hebrew word we should all know, the term for spirit, ruach, which can mean spirit or breath or wind, the very breath or spirit of God is within us. And so there's a lot that can be extrapolated from that theologically. Ben, you were doing some of that work for us. Surely you were doing that as well to just say that when we have the breath of God within us, when we have the divine in us, then it is um theologically very powerful to think about that god we are made in the image of god and for this to be written by like you uh i am so sorry can you remind me your name um james's dad uh, toby. toby thanks toby um toby to say that it's kind of rooted in this aggressive culture yeah we're going to get into war we're going to get into ethnic violence um but for this people group to have this story of all of humanity made in god's image as what they're rooted in as 
a way towards peace. Um, there's a, a, a real beauty to that. Other comments? Yeah, I go want ahead. to say something about the being fruitful and multiplying. Yeah. Um, it seems that uh, it's, 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 it's just like the first mitzvah, the first you know, command to humans, it would be unreasonable for you know really holy, upstanding people to not follow it. Mm -hmm. um, and like, especially, I think it's Matthew that talks about how Jesus followed all the laws. It would be not really, wouldn't really add up for him to not have gotten married, mm -hmm. and have kids. So they call mm -hmm. him rabbi, all the rabbis get mm -hmm. married. Uh, it just doesn't really add up to me. Yeah. So Ben's saying, you know, when you, so uh, mitzvah, meaning the laws, mm -hmm. and they count how many laws there are, 613 laws. So Jesus saying he follows all the laws, yet this being one of the mitzvot um, doesn't add up. Yeah. So, yeah, that's good. It was that wedding in Cana that everybody said whose wedding was. <laughs> oh, wedding in Cana. Whose wedding was it? <laughs> uh, all right. Good, good. I love so many questions on this phrase. So let's get to the other one, dominion. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth. So there are four different Hebrew words used in the first two chapters of Genesis to speak to this concept of dominion or tilling the earth. This one is the one that has the strongest connotation. So once we get into Genesis 2, the words are often used in other places in Hebrew writing in a very subdued kind of gardening, tilling, you know, hoeing the land type of way. This one is the one that has the most force to it. Um, and it speaks mostly of authority, to have authority over something. Reactions to that, the idea that God gives humanity authority over something. He would wrestle with that. Okay, so thinking of the, the Latin, yeah. Yeah. But it's now in English, it's a lot more um, military. So now in English, it feels like a military type of word, but origins in God's authority. So you're spot on there. So maybe we could have some reactions to what it means that God has authority and then gives authority. Yeah, Toby? Well, it all seems sort of like after the fact justification or rationalization or the way you want to behave. Okay, okay, yeah. Meaning people read this word and they rationalize into the word how so they want to behave? You're, you're creating God in your image in a way to justify your actions. Mm -hmm. you know, so. Creating God. Okay, that's okay. Both of these comments are, are good. And I mean, you can see it as God's letting me do whatever I want, or you could see it like, you know, God's handing the keys to the car to the teenager. And saying, well, if I'm going to have this child and have this human that's going to be this, you know, creative and everything, there, there's risk, but I'm going to take the risk. Yeah. So, surely saying, um, speaking of this word dominion, we could look at it as control or force, or the analogy she uses is parents giving the keys to the car over to their child and saying, my authority now i'm giving you the authority to drive this car and make your own choices even if there's risks involved wow that was good bob that's why i've always wanted that word to mean responsibility you've always wanted the word to mean responsibility mm -hmm. yeah i say that too because it seems like authority that like that responsibility goes right with that i know the, the paul has to happen yes and the chapter two that's that but it's like it's so human to say why well, just want the authority part of Ooh. Wow, Kevin's saying you know, the fall hasn't happened yet, but it seems so human to say, I want the authority without the responsibility. Wow. Yeah. So we want this to mean responsibility. And I think we can get there while being honest to the text, being honest to this word, meaning authority. 
I'm thinking of some words Jesus uses to teach his disciples about authority, where he says, you see that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over you, but not so that when you have authority, it is in service to others. And as you make these comments about what it means to be made in the image of God or how we make God in our image, we're being presented with a text in which God's authority is used to do something external to God, that God exists in the universe and has all of the authority in the universe and yet chooses to be involved in the act of creating something external to God's self. And so God is bringing something else into existence and causing it to flourish, saying that it's good, wanting it to flourish. And so God is using God's authority to help other things come into being. And then that same authority is given to humanity and surely is saying not just to lord it over or have dominion as we think this word means now, but instead that our authority when it looks like God causes things external to ourselves to thrive authority with responsibility. So I think we can take the very forceful nature of this word in Hebrew, but look at what God is doing with God's authority and come up with something different than the way in which this word is used to exploit and diminish when authority is meant for flourishing. Yeah, surely. Well, the thing is, it says authority over everything else. It doesn't say authority over one another. Ooh. Yeah. So we specialize in that. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It does not say authority over one another. We specialize in that. Oof. Yeah, some ground rules we have, um, some Adama rules we have exceeded. Yeah, Toby. What was your, what's your name? Donna. Donna. Because you also picked up a, a word that very closely linked, uh, that comes a little like subdue. Yeah. So that's, dominion and subdue go very much hand in hand. <laughs> so we are talking kind of in that vein. It's what yeah. they're voting for. They have to be on the board because you're going to subdue all the world. They have to yep. follow the cattle. And you're like, what? <laughs> but at that time, it might have been for them. That's how you're going to be strong and continue to live on earth. Yeah. So that was available. Yeah. Here in the chat, uh, Rick says, FYI, the good news Bible uses the word power rather than yeah. dominion. Um, and I think that is the same conversation in play in our modern day. What is power? Who has power? How do you use power? If you have power, can that power be used in service to others? So um, there's a um, thinking of a, a great book written by, um, it's by an evangelical pastor, but it's really well done. Um, Andy Crouch about power and how do we use power in light of God's power? And it's a great analysis of how God uses God's power. So thanks, Rick. Okay. We any other comments on Dominion? No. What's the next comment? Well, I, I don't know if we're at twenty-seven. I'm just wondering. So it repeats the language of twenty-six, but the hour becomes his. So it's not plural or singular or masculine, and it looks like it's a colon. It looks like it's a quotation, and that doesn't have a sign. Yes. So this inserting of it does mean that the vocabulary used in the original manuscript would be such to suggest that it is poetry. So could it be quoting a song that was sung within the community, most likely? Uh, and so that's why it's subset here. Um, Kevin notes that we've got a change in pronoun. Let's go back to that handy interlinear. So God, and we got the Elohim here. Okay, so that's where we get his, is that 
letter right there. Um, so you made the comment Elohim is plural, um, but then it's used with a singular ending. Um, so yeah, the ancient authors are, are, are you know, it's, it's poetic. So playing around as you would within any sort of literature, any sort of poetry with tense in person. You know, it would it would be written just in block. No spacing, no chapters, no versing. Letter after letter after letter. Yeah. So we do this in our English Bibles, but we don't have this in the original text. So they would have done this to just say, like, based on our scholarly analysis, we think that they were quoting a, a song here, but no idea for sure. Okay. All right. Anything else? So let's just wrap up this chapter. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food and it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good, and there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. It's kind of setting up the problem of the commons here, too. The food, the trees are meant for food, so if you subdue it in a way that you over-harvest and destroy the ground, then you are only causing more problems for yourself by virtue of not having food anymore. As I'm sure you're well aware it's also there are no carnivores. No carnivores. We are not, yeah, we're not told that to eat the animals. Yeah. So um, in preparation for our lesson, I found out that half of the living things on earth are insects. Hmm. Yeah, isn't that funny? So Wendy's saying in preparing for a lesson, discover that half of the living things on earth are insects. And I think it's like, this is just, I need to fact check myself, but it's like some absurdly high percentage of species that have ever existed are extinct now, because most of them are also insects that we don't have around anymore. And a lot of them have been showing up in my kitchen. A lot of them are in your kitchen. <laughs> half, of, half, of the, half of the species of the earth have been in your kitchen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if people have listened to podcasts on eradicating mosquitoes and just how complicated that is because of how important mosquitoes are for the greater ecosystem. Yeah. I was going to ask if this comes to Kevin's point, I think in 29 about the trees and the sea bearing plants being our food. Um, is that where like Seventh-day Adventists and uh, like Rastafarians get the prescription for vegetarian diet? Yes, absolutely. Um, and so kind of the idea of trying to get back to creation, Eden, and so that, that would be the theological undergirding for it is a return to this Edenic paradise. Yeah. All right. Chapter two. I love it. Two weeks on chapter one. There is a lot here. So let's just dip our toes and then we'll wind down. Um, bum, 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 bum. Um, <laughs> let me say, before yeah, go we, ahead. Before we go there, I'm sorry, just because. Yeah, I need to go back too. I was, uh, I missed last week, so I apologize. Huh? But um, I don't know if we, so I don't know if we talked about it uh, just at the, at the beginning where uh, it's like one or two. Um, I know that. Uh, some uh, theologians have gone back and talked about this wind that swept over the face of the waters, mm. which it seems like the waters are already there, right? He makes the the heaven and the earth, but the waters that were were already there. Um, yeah. But anyways, uh, they have come back and said this wind is the Holy Spirit. 
Um, but um, would the ancient Hebrews have conceptualized this wind in that way, or are they uh, just relating it to this breath of life concept that they would be in the Adam and Adam? Yeah, so I, I think that's a fair argument that the original author. So the question is this idea of the wind of God being the spirit of God. When does this concept come into play? So I think the folks writing this would have already had that concept um, only because the word ruach can have all of those meanings. It can mean wind. Um, and so they would have thought that now would they, they're not differentiated as into like, and quite the concept of the Trinity we have, but very much that God's breath or the spirit of God, that there is God's presence in creation, that God is not just somewhere else, but that God's spirit is amongst us. That would have, that would have definitely been in play already. But could we draw a line between that and like the spirit that comes into you upon baptism that brings gifts of the spirit, speaking in tongues and all that stuff? Yeah. So, um, that is definitely the basis for that. Mm -hmm. So on that day of Pentecost, they're going to say, you know, the spirit of God has come upon us and that's what we're experiencing, the gift of tongues, etc. So they would have had that as a basis for God's spirit entering you. It's going to be developed more. But the reason why these early Jews before they're Christians can use that language is because it already exists. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 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 um. What else do I want to say? Oh, just cosmologically, I don't know. We didn't note this or pick up on this, but um, last week, so God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. The reason that language exists is because they believed that the source of groundwater and the source of rainwater were from two different places. They didn't have the water cycle in mind yet. So they thought that there was some sort of watery chaos beneath the ground and some sort of watery chaos above the sky. So that's why it separates it in that way. Yeah, you know, just because uh, we're talking about some of these things, even in the first, uh, the first lines, the, the, the stress going over the water. It's like water is such a big deal. And I know that in our uh, baptism ceremony, we talk about yeah. the, maybe something good about water, but it just seems like the Hebrews were a lot like, I mean, the, the Southern California weather, their weather, not that different, but they've been around the desert. And it's like water is our chaos. We don't know what to do with it just because it's it's the problem that comes to us. And so you see that in the flow, and you see it with separating water. Something has to be done at all times. To do. Yeah, surely just noting that the water is representative of the chaos. Um, and that is spot on too on what's happening here is that the water already exists before the creation because chaos exists before the creation. God exists, chaos exists, God has to subdue the chaos. So water is both chaos, the ocean is so wide and vast and hasn't been explored in its entirety, you could get lost in it easily at this time. And it's also life, you're near a desert, you're in the desert, you don't know where your water source is, you're dead. So you've got to be able to control the water as well as humanity. Okay. Yeah. Wendy says it's interesting that they call it a dome. It is. Cosmology extend beyond that. Maybe that's how you create the idea. Mm. Yeah. Um. And that may be a way to help us understand kind of the shape of what they're understanding by using that word dome. Yeah. yeah. I saw reference to that as a hard shell. That Hebrew word? Yeah. 
<laughs> oh, shield. Oh, I thought you were speaking Hebrew. I was like, oh, you were you were close. Yeah, there's not quite. I thought you, <laughs> you were very close to what the word was. That's why that. That's funny. Um, like a shield. Yeah, absolutely. A shield to prevent the chaos from encroaching. Absolutely, that's what's going on here in their mind cosmologically. Great. Um, okay. In the story of Gilgamesh, also the idea of finite. I don't remember. I did not read Gilgamesh, but I read about Gilgamesh. Yeah, so um, there's another text called the Enuma Elish, in which an evil god is torn apart, and the two halves are the two halves of the dome. Um, so there's other there's other dome language in the ancient Near East. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Donna. Um, okay, uh, last thing. Sixth day of creation is very good. It's different language than just good. What happens on the sixth day is very good. So very good, we're going to extrapolate on it. So when we get into chapter two next week, what we will do to begin with is we'll read a little bit of chapter two and ask for your observations on what you see as the differences between chapter two and chapter one. Because what we're getting is a second creation text. And so we'll wanna see what you note on what differences there might be. All right, let me close this with a word of prayer. God, we are so grateful, as always, for this time to dwell in your scripture. There's a lot that we talked about today that we ask to remain with us and to inform how we live in this world. We pray that we can understand your authority and the ways in which you are part of a creative process, that we too might be part of a creative process to bring goodness and flourishing into the creation around us. May we be people who see your divine stamp in everything that we encounter and every creature and every person. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you in worship. <laughs>